So today we are continuing our series called Transforming. So we began a couple of weeks ago about, uh, we were thinking about how uh, Christian spir- spiritual formation is uh, the hope of the world and also the hope uh, for us personally uh, as we seek to live that rich, full, abundant life that Jesus wants to give to us. And then last week we talked about the five different aspects of human life, um, heart and mind and spirit and body soul and body, and then our uh, social context and how God uh, transforms us as we partner with him. Uh, And uh, this week we're thinking about evil, goodness, and spiritual change. And kind of the framework that we're going to be using today is the, well, I'll talk about that later. But before that, I will tell you that in June, I bought a used vehicle through Facebook Marketplace. Has anybody else here bought a used vehicle at some point in their life? So, uh, I don't know how it's, your experience was, but with me, what I tend to do is, first of all, do a whole bunch of research. In fact, my wife, Susan, says I do a better job of uh, vehicle buying when I obsess about it for at least two weeks. And uh, I picked the model and, you know, the, kind of the mileage and the, the features that we're looking for. And then I start looking at various uh, options and where they're located. And so I found this one vehicle and I went and I had a look at it and, and I, I was mindful of what they were asking for it. So I uh, asked if they would consider a, a lower offer. And uh, to my surprise, I was able to buy it for a little less money than what I thought I would need to spend. Uh, But that turned out to be a good thing because when I took that vehicle to my mechanic, I ended up spending more than what I thought I would spend. So here's the question, though. Whenever we do something like buy a vehicle, or you could apply this to any purchase, how do you know if you made a good deal? And there's a very simple way to calculate this. When you buy something, you give up the cash that you have on hand. And so the way we can figure out if we've made a good deal or not is if the vehicle we bought is worth more to us than the cash we give up, then we've made a good deal. And sometimes we don't know that answer right away. Sometimes we've got to take that vehicle to the mechanic and find out what needs to be fixed. And Sometimes we need to wait and drive it for a while and and see how much it costs to run that thing when gas is $2.35 and you filled up just before it went down, but I'm not bitter. (laughs) And we can apply, now let's make this personal, we can apply this same principle to life. Because as you and I go through life, and it is the one and only life we will ever have, We are constantly making decisions about what life we're going to live. And all along the way, at each decision point, we are choosing to not live this life and instead live that life. And so how do we know that we're making good decisions as we do that? Well, it's the same kind of thing. If the life that we gain through the decision we make is worth more to us than the life we give up, then we've made a good decision. But the key is how we value things. And so how do we know if we are valuing things correctly when we make our decisions, especially our big life decisions? Like, I mean, where does that standard of values that we use come from? And where does it lead to? And the stakes are extremely high. And Jesus makes this clear when he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And so this is a critical question for us. What are we going to choose? How do we value things? 
And so as we reflect on these matters this morning, uh, the framework that we're going to use is, first of all, a soul ruined by evil, then a soul restored by God's goodness and a reliable pattern for spiritual change. So first, a soul ruined by evil. And so as we take a look at the state of human hearts in general, it's like Kevin said in the office, it's bad, it's real bad. And God says the same thing in Jeremiah when he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And we would like to think that, oh, perhaps this just applies to people outside the church. But inside the church, the presence of pride and egoism and fear and you could go on and on and on, plus the ongoing list of church leaders who have failed indicates that it's just not so. That human hearts within the church need to be renovated as well. That we have this problem just like everybody else does. And the tragedy of the condition of human hearts is made worse because of the great value of a human soul. And C.S. Lewis challenges us to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of an ant, a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. But it is worse outside the church. And it's worse outside the church because there is no fear of God and no relational knowledge of God. And when I mean fear of God, what I mean is fear of being at cross purposes with God. Fear of not doing what he wants us to do and not being the person that he calls us to be. God is not mean, but like electricity or nuclear energy, he is dangerous. And as Mr. Beaver said to Susan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe about Aslan, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And so this is where we need to begin by acknowledging that evil has had a damaging effect on our soul and that it resides there. And so we start by breaking out of the denial that we all tend to have. Because you see, a human life apart from God cannot survive unless it lies to itself and says that it's okay when it's really not okay. And so we need to break free of that delusion and recognize and admit the reality of the evil that's in our own hearts and the toxic damage it has done there. That's the starting point. And we bring that before God. It's as we... Uh, Read in Romans 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. There is no fear of God 
before their eyes. This is the state of humanity. But let's turn now to a soul restored by God's goodness because there is hope. And there's hope because of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus came into this world and became one of us in order to save us, because he lived a perfect human life, because he went to the cross to suffer and die for the sins of the whole world, because he rose again from the dead. We have hope. Because what Jesus has done is he's paid the full cost for us to be brought into life with God. And we are brought into that life with God the moment that We believe the moment that the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of faith. And throughout our life with God, well, let me uh, pause for a moment before I carry on. In that life that we have with God, through Jesus Christ, as a totally free gift, we have forgiveness for all our sins and everlasting life. That is 100% assured. And in the life that we live with God, He is constantly inviting us to partner with him in the transformation of our soul. And that happens by dying to ourselves and inviting him to come in and transform us with his love. Let's go back to Jesus' words. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Now, what does Jesus mean here? When he says deny ourselves, he's talking about denying all of the darkness that is within us. We cannot simply take Jesus Christ and the forgiveness and eternal life that he gives to us and add it to the natural life we already have to try to enhance it. That's like taking a diamond ring and putting it in a garbage pit. The goodness of the diamond ring will be overwhelmed by all of the garbage. And what needs to happen is all of the garbage needs to be taken out of that pit and hauled away so that the goodness of the diamond ring can have its full effect. And it's the same with us. All of the evil, the darkness, the garbage within us, we bring that before Jesus, and he cleans it all away. What happens here, it's a process of replacing those evil habits and tendencies and feelings that we tend to have in our heart with the goodness of God. That's how our souls are transformed. And so uh, when Jesus said, deny ourselves, take up our cross, the cross, and people would have known it at the time, was an instrument of execution. And so that old self within us needs to die. And what we do is we live day by day in a state that's called death to self. And so what that means is it's uh, turning away from a self-centered, self-directed life and turning toward a Jesus-centered, Jesus-directed life. Now, keep in mind a couple of really important things. Denying ourselves is not the same as rejecting ourselves. Self-rejection is actually a very serious spiritual problem that can only be remedied when we see, with the help of the Holy Spirit, when we see ourselves as Jesus sees us. So it's not self-rejection. We're only talking about that old sinful self. That's who we need to turn away from. We need to remember that our soul is always precious and of infinite value to God. 
The second thing that's really important to remember is um, Jesus is not advocating what uh, some of you may have encountered called miserable sinner uh, spirituality. And miserable sinner spirituality is this idea that uh, the human soul is not capable, well, humanity is not capable of uh, redemption, uh, progress in becoming more like Jesus Christ. And so the only way of salvation is getting rid of the body. And such a view is not biblical. And Jesus came with a human body in order to redeem all of us, including our bodies. And so it's not that, it's not miserable uh, sinner Christianity that Jesus is talking about when he says these words. Uh, But the truth that's in there, the grain of truth that's in there is we can't make progress towards becoming like Jesus Christ on our own. It's always God's power that's doing it within us. It's always a gift from God. And so what we do is we open the door for that transformation to happen within us by denying ourselves and taking up our cross and then following Jesus. And Dallas Willard said this, Christian spiritual formation rests on this indispensable foundation of death to self and cannot proceed except insofar as that foundation is being firmly laid and sustained. And so this is an important aspect for us to consider. Yes, there is hope. There is always hope with Jesus Christ. But he's calling us to lay down our life and then with open hands receive the life that he wants to give to us, which is far, far better. John Calvin said this, For as the surest source of destruction to men is to obey themselves, so then the only haven of safety is to have no other will, no other wisdom than to follow the Lord wherever he leads. Let this then be the first step, to abandon ourselves and devote the whole energy of our minds to the service of God. And so what he's talking about is, in in our natural state, our inclination is to make ourselves the center of our world and the director of our life. And instead, Jesus is calling us to let him be the center of our world and let him be the director of our life. This is what it means to follow Jesus. It means to intentionally decide that we will do the things that he calls us to do and live as he calls us to live, being the person that he calls us to be. Not in order to earn salvation, but because we already are saved by Jesus. And in response to his love for us, this is how we love him in return, with our lives. And as we do that, what we will find is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control will flow from us into the lives of others. And so... uh, when we have a clear picture of just what our life is worth on its own and what the life that Jesus is offering to us is worth, then we would make that transaction, you could say, in a heartbeat because we know that what God is offering us through Jesus is infinitely more precious than what we could ever try and manufacture on our own. And then some of those parables that Jesus told about heaven and life with him, they start to make sense. Because in Jesus, we can see that the life that he is offering to us, that deeper life that he is offering to us, is a precious treasure. And so it makes complete sense to go and sell the rest of our life in order to 
gain what Jesus is giving to us. And we see that in Jesus, we have a pearl of great value that is worth so much that it's a very simple thing for us to go and sell the rest of our life in order to receive that precious pearl. So let's move on to our third part, a reliable pattern for spiritual change. So it's important for us to see how things really are, both in our heart and in the life that Jesus is offering to give to us. But something more than that is also required, and that is seeing how things could be. To capture a vision for our life, on a deeper level with Jesus. To live that rich, full, abundant life in which we have no worries or cares because our Lord is with us and He's carrying us, He's leading us, and He's providing for us. And so when we have that kind of a vision in our minds, and it's a vision that we indeed want, then the next step is something called intention because there's choices that will need to be made along the way. And what's key is having the intention to move towards that vision that we have in mind, to move into a deeper life with Jesus. And that's followed then by the means, or you could say the tools, for how we do that. And what it involves is uh, taking a look at our own lives and recognizing those, those habits, those thoughts, those emotions, those patterns in our lives that are keeping us from going deeper with Jesus. And then uh, looking to Jesus for the help that we need to replace those things with His goodness. And that can look different for different people. It can even look different for the same person at different points in their life. But the important thing to remember is when we have our heart and mind captured by that vision of a deeper life with Jesus and we've made the intention to go into that deeper life with the help and direction of the Holy Spirit, God will provide the means. There's that saying, where there's a will, there's a way. And so it's important for our will to be headed after life with Jesus. Because the other way is also true. Where there's no will, there's no way. And I don't know if you're like me, but what I tend to do is I tend to focus on the means. Like, how am I going to get this done? And if you're like that, um, I want to encourage you to just pause and go back to the vision and the intention. And I would say the vision is the most important thing. Uh, Let God worry about the means. He will give them to you at just the right time. But focus on that vision of deeper life with Jesus and, and then on intending to actually enter into it. And some of the things that can uh, help us, uh, some examples of means are... Uh, meditating upon and studying the life of Jesus and what he taught and his world and then our own lives. That's one way. Another way is to, uh, to consider the way of not following Jesus and the bitter consequences of that and then compare it to the way of Jesus and what the consequences of that are. And then a third uh, thing that can be helpful to us is to study the lives of real-life saints who engaged with the enemies of Jesus and served his people. And that can help us as well. Uh, One thing that's important, and I think I'll be talking about this more next Sunday, is this self-training that we're doing. We can't do it in moments of crisis. It just doesn't work. And so what we need to do is is practice training ourselves when we're not in moments of crisis so that we can be prepared for the crisis that may come in the future. 
And so another thing we could do is uh, doing sacrificial things uh, at times when, you know, it's not such a hard thing to do, but that kind of gets us uh, in the mode of thinking in that direction. So this, you can remember this uh, with the acronym VIM, so vision, intention, mission. VIM is the pathway God gives us towards abundant life, that rich, full, abundant life that he promises to give us through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you about two people who uh, lived this deeper life. And the first was uh, George Mueller of uh, England. And he said this, there was a day when I died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will, died to the world, its approval or censure, died to the approval or blame even of my brethren or friends. And since then, I've studied only to show myself approved unto God. So what did God do with this life of George Mueller? Well, George formed uh, an institute, uh, a spiritual knowledge institute, and uh, that group uh, supported missionaries and uh, printed uh, Bibles and tracts. It printed, that group printed over 100 million Bibles, New Testaments, and tracts. Uh, it also organized day schools for children, and hundreds of uh, children went through those day schools, and also um, established orphanages for children who did not have parents. And hundreds of children went through those as well. And George and the people around him did all of this purely through faith and prayer. They didn't ask anybody for any money at any time. Uh, They didn't receive any government funding. All they did was pray, and God provided. And as Dallas Willard writes, uh, small wonder that it was said of Mueller that he had the 23rd Psalm written on his face. The second person I want to tell you about is Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim, uh, at a very young age, in his early 20s, uh, decided he was going to be a missionary. And while he was uh, preparing during his language uh, studies, he heard of one particular tribe in Ecuador who had not been reached. And uh, it's spelled and pronounced in different ways, uh, but I think it's the Hu-Orani, Haurani tribe. And they were a very um, um, fierce, um, dangerous tribe to try and have any encounter with. Uh, So he and uh, a group of fellow missionaries started trying to reach them. They would uh, drop uh, gifts from the plane as they flew over them. And after several months of doing this, uh, they were encouraged enough to land and try and make person-to-person contact with them. And that was in January of 1956. Uh, They were met by 10 warriors who uh, killed Jim and all four of his companions. And yet, uh, God brought some good out of that because Jim wrote this in his journal, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. And Jim's widow, Elizabeth, along with a widow of one of the other men, Rachel Saint, went back to that very same tribe within about three years and shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and several of them became Christians. And Jim's story was shared around the world and thousands of young people have been inspired to follow him into full-time ministry of the gospel sharing the good news in various ways and so dear friends the challenge that i want to leave before you today is this to trade your self-directed self-centered life for the jesus-centered jesus-directed life that our Lord is offering to you. I guarantee you, in the name of Jesus, 
that you will not regret it. And it will be the best deal you have ever made in your life. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we need you so very, very much. Uh, We need you to open our eyes and see things how they really are, both in our own life and the world around us, but also in the life that you are offering to us, the deeper life. And so we pray, Lord, that you would capture our hearts with a vision of what life with you can be like. And by your Spirit, we pray that you would move us to intend to to decide to enter into that life with you. And we pray, Lord, that in your timing, as you know us best, you would provide the means for us to cast aside those old habits, that old way of living, and then receive the new habits, the new way of thinking and feeling and living and being that you have for us. And we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in our lives, not for our sake, but for the sake of the people around us, so that they could see you and know you and your great love for them as well. In your holy and precious name we ask this, and all God's people said, Amen.